Uh, I want to just get started in the interest of time. I'm going to still, you know, honor our time frame so that we're not, you know, running over the things that you uh, need to do today. And um, is get going. So first of all, I want to thank the three of you for joining me today for this discussion on public art. Um, I'm pretty sure you've all been on panels in the past, and so hopefully we can, you know, go down some uncharted territory in today's conversation and not just the same old same, but, you know, uh, even the same old same can sometimes be very informative. Um, I'm going to begin by reading um, your bios. Uh, there may be some abbreviations, um, but I encourage everyone who is watching this to go on to your respective websites to read all about you in greater detail and also about what your organizations are doing. Um, Melanie Kress is a curator and writer based in New York. She's the associate curator for the Highline um, Art, where since 2014, she has commissioned and presented projects with artists, including Maria Teresa Alves, Fierly Baez, Lubina Haimib, Sky Hopinka, Zoe Leonard, Sabor Lee Smith, and Tourmaline, among many others. In 2010, she co-founded the Brooklyn-based project space Concrete Utopia, of which she was director and chief curator. She is currently a critic at Yale School of Art and holds a BA in art history and visual arts from Bernard College and the MA in contemporary art theory from Goldsmiths University in London. Uh, Natasha L. Logan is the deputy director at Creative Time. Since joining the team in 2016, she has held numerous roles, including project manager and director of programming. Before working at Creative Time, Natasha worked alongside respected artists across film, art, uh, interactive technology. She led Hank Willis Thomas's studio and collaborative initiatives. She managed ongoing projects, including Question Bridge and In Search of the Truth, The Truth Booth, as well as national commissions. Her film credits include co-executive producing and oversimplification of her beauty by Terrence Nance and transmedia producer for the documentary film American Promise, which earned a 2014 Doc Impact Award. Um, Elizabeth Masella is the Senior Public Art Coordinator at New York City Parks or NYC Parks. She works with a diverse group of artists, community groups, and arts organizations and government agencies to bring both innovative and traditional public art to parks in New York City's five boroughs. She has managed over 100 temporary public outdoor art installations and organized several exhibitions for the Arsenal Gallery in Central Park. Elizabeth has her MFA in art criticism and writing from the School of Visual Arts and a BA in art history and visual art from Fordham University. I wanna thank the three of you for joining me today. Um, as I mentioned, I know that you know bios don't cover it all. So what I would love to do is to give each of you um, an opportunity to share a little bit more about yourself, the work that you do at your organization. And um, as, I, as I mentioned in a previous email that I sent out to the group, um, if you have some visuals that you'd like to share while you're going through your introduction, just please let me know. You should be able to use the screen share function on your own, but if for any reason you need me to turn anything on, just uh, let me know. We'll begin with, uh, um, with you, Melanie. Thank you so much. Hi, Dexter, thank you so much for having me. I, just because we've had a couple of Zoom glitches and I've been on a handful of these things, I just wanna triple check. It might be because I'm not a co-host, but I don't see any attendees. You see attendees, right? You're on mute. Sorry. <laughs> um, I do not, but we are recording this uh, for the school. So um, I think that I will, um, I would recommend that we proceed. Um, primarily because, I, I mean, in the interest of your time, I'm not Okay, quite I just wanted to make sure that we were projecting, sure, because in a um, webinar, you have to the... hit the projecting button, but great, right. I will go for it. Um, so, um, my name is, let me just check that I have my slides are working because sometimes it freezes for a second. Um, thank you for that kind introduction. And my name is Melanie Kress. As you said, I am the Associate Curator for the Highland Art Program. And I will share a few slides here and also time myself. Um, Highland Art is the public art program presented on and around the Highline in New York City. We show work in a wide range of formats ranging from monumental scale commissions um, and our newest format here, Highline Plinth, um, also on and around the Highline neighboring 
buildings and in the neighborhood. Um, we also show performances and video programs. Um, we invite about two or three artists every summer to transform the park into an open air theater. Um, our Highline Chandler program presents video and film by contemporary artists and filmmakers from around the world and changes about every two months. Um, we have a number of artworks on view right now and we work with about 30 artists every year um, commissioning and producing new artworks. And so we invite artists to imagine the, the park as an open air uh, museum um, and to think about projects that they would realize indoors and then imagine them for outdoors or something that they wouldn't be able to realize anywhere else. Um, the vast majority of the commissions that we show stay on view from 12 months and rotate every spring um, with a handful of exceptions um, that Elizabeth knows about. The Plinth program stays on view for 18 months because it's a much larger scale than everything else that we do in the park. Um, but the program had started in 2009 and over the course of the last, I've been saying 10 years for too long now, so over the course of the last 12 years, uh, we've worked with over 400 artists. And so it's a really nice opportunity to invite artists who've worked in the public realm before, um, but also artists who've never worked out to outdoors before to think in brand new ways and to really bring their practices to a new level. And with that, um, I will pass it to my next colleague. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Natasha, we'd love for, to hear from you as well. Great. Hi, thanks so much for having me. Um, I'm going to attempt to screen share. We'll see if it works. Let's see if I can. Can you see my screen? Awesome. Um, so I'm Natasha Logan. I'm the W director at Creative Time. Creative Time is also a public arts organization. We've been around for almost 50 years. We'll be celebrating that anniversary and milestone in about two years. Um, we work with artists of you know, all different backgrounds, mediums and genres to create temporary site-specific public works that's free and open to the public. And we really like to think that our work deals with the debates, dreams and dialogues of our time. So we really are interested in artwork that sort of activates and invites the public to um, be in conversation or in thought or inspiration around issues that intersect with um, art and social justice, and in particular work that thinks about social practice and socially engaged um, environments and, and, and ideas. So we've done about 350 projects, primarily in New York, but sometimes in other parts of the world. We've done a project in outer space. Um, and as I mentioned, the projects are all um, site specific. So we really follow the vision of our artists, um, the material, medium, and topic that they're trying to convey and work to identify a site that is really relevant and resonant. And oftentimes we're dealing with sites that have a history of being in, in the public realm, but may not be currently or are being reintroduced to the public in a particular way. Um, in addition to our commissions of which we do about two to three per year, we also have been doing um, a convening which is called the Creative Time Summit for the past decade. Um, well, it was a decade in 2019, and then we've taken a pause, as many folks um, in the convening and conferences space have. But that is really a space where we think about the intersection very, very directly between art and social justice. So we ask um, makers, activists, thinkers, writers, doers to come together around a central topic from their particular purview. Um, and we spend a couple of days thinking about um, possibilities for a collective future. And we pick a different topic sometimes a different location. And a lot of our work that's more in the initiative and idea space is centered around these opportunities of bringing people together to think about ways that artists and art, artistic practice can move the needle on the issues that we all contend with across the globe. Um, so I'm excited to be part of this conversation tonight. Thank you so much for that. And Elizabeth, um, you're next. <laughs> I'm just gonna pull up some images I have here. Um, so there's just a sampling of uh, some of the projects that we currently have on view right now. Um, I think we have about 50 projects on view throughout the city. Um, so I am the senior public art coordinator with the NYC Parks Art in the Parks program. Um, I have been at parks, sorry, this little weird pop-up keeps showing, but uh, just ignore that. Um, so I've been at NYC Parks uh, since 2016. Um, we do about 50 to 60 projects in a normal year. Yes, 
last year was a little bit different uh, with the pandemic, but we still managed to have a couple dozen projects on view. Um, our program was founded in 1967. In the last 50 plus years, we've exhibited over 2000 works of art in parks throughout the city. Um, we've worked with about 1300 artists in, um, you know, over, I think probably more at this point, last time I counted over 200 parks. Um, but basically our program is anytime you're in a park and you see art, um, it's us. Um, temporary public art is typically on view for up to one year. Um, and the slides that I'm clicking through just show you um, a wide variety of the different kinds of projects we do. It's not all just sculpture. We do work with uh, muralists. Um, you know, we work with big galleries, arts organizations, other city agencies, museums, uh, community groups, schools, uh, photographers, sculptors. Um, it's a real wide variety and I'm never, um, you know, bored with this job. Every artist brings us a different project. Every project has its challenges. Um, you know, it transforms a park. Um, you know, no pro two projects are the same. And just to give you an example too, we have some really small projects on view. Um, this is, these pieces are made out of um, apples uh, that were dehydrated and cast in brass. So um, that just is to show you that an artwork doesn't have to be 10 feet tall. It can be three inches tall. Um, and in addition to what we do in the parks, uh, we also oversee the Arsenal Gallery in the park's headquarters in Central Park. Uh, we usually have about five or six shows there. This is our current show, which actually isn't open to the public right now, but we're hoping it might be before the end of the year. Um, but in the Arsenal Gallery, we show um, artworks dealing with uh, themes of nature, uh, the urban environment, parks, uh, parks history. Um, so that's in a nutshell, our program. We're just a small staff of two, so um, we're never, I guess it's never a dull moment um, in the Art in the Parks program. <laughs> Thank you so much for that, Elizabeth. Uh, Melanie, I'd love to, to come back to you for a moment. Um, I've spent a lot of time on the High Line um, since, its, uh, since its opening. And uh, obviously, you know, art has um, been a big part of the experience going there. And I'm quite sure uh, many artists who visit the High Line probably ask themselves, how does an artist get a work on the High Line? What, what, what is that process? Um, is, it, is, it, uh, is it an invitational? Do you have to submit a proposal? Can you walk us through sort of like how that happens? So it's a very common question, you can imagine. Um, and so we have a couple of different formats, but for the most part, it's a curated program. And so there are, um, we have a small team. We have a director and chief curator, Cecilia Alamani, myself, a production director who oversees all of the physical installations. And again, Elizabeth has worked close with closely with for many years. And then we have a curatorial and exhibitions assistant who also works with us on the curatorial side and then also on production. Um, and so the vast majority of the projects you'll see are what we call a curated program. And so Cecilia and I will invite artists. The process for that um, is that for commissions especially, we invite artists about one or two years out from when we would imagine that they would produce an object. Um, we have a couple of solo commissions every year. And so those projects are larger in scale, working with an individual artist on something a bit larger. And then we have a thematic group exhibition every year. And so for example, this year's is called the Musical Brain. And we've invited nine artists to respond to that theme of thinking about music, music outdoors and music and public art. Um, and so when we invite an artist, we invite them to come for a walk first, travel and other restrictions permitting. Um, and we'll invite them to think about something that inspires them in the park and then also a few locations that they like. The High Line is a mile and a half long. There are thousands of different places that you could put an artwork. And so it's really important for us to think about both the idea that an artist has and the logistics of the location and how it would look best. Um, then once someone comes up with a proposal in a few locations, we'll work with them to find which location would be best for that proposal and how to produce that object or that sculpture for the next year's program. Um, the, um, there are a couple of exceptions to that. So the Highland Print Program is actually goes through a nomination process every three years. And so I said those sculptures stay on view for a year and a half. So for every two sculptures, we will invite nominators from around the world, artists, curators, museum folks, to nominate up to three artists each those artists we then invite to submit proposals. From those proposals, we narrow down to a short list. And so for the third and fourth commissions, which will go up next fall, and then I always, 
I have to do the math in my head. I believe in spring of 2024, um, we received 80 proposals from artists from 40 countries around the world. We then shared those proposals online. We got feedback from thousands of individuals on their thoughts on the projects. And then with that feedback and lots of internal and external discussions, we narrowed down to a short list of 12 artists. Those 12 artists then made um, small maquettes or sculptural models of their projects, which are currently on view for maybe just a couple more weeks on the High Line if you haven't caught them yet. And then from those 12, we narrow down to the final two. Um, and so we're in the process of selecting the third and fourth commissions from those 12. We also have a proposal process um, for what's called High Line Originals for our video program, similar to the way that the High Line Plinth functions, but on a smaller scale. And so every two years, we commission a new work in video this program started in 2019 with commissioning Tourmaline's beautiful Salacia video, which is now also in the collections of the Museum of Modern Art in New York and Tate in London. Um, and so every couple of years, we'll invite a number of local nominators, artists often who have been in the program in the past, and then curators who are relatively local to New York City or the tri-state area, again, to nominate a few artists who, um, and in both of these programs, we're really thinking about ways that these different projects can launch an artist to a new place in their career. So someone who might not necessarily have the kind of visibility that Tourmaline now has um, to propose a new work that they would then realize over the course of a year in video or film. A long answer, but thorough, I hope. No, that's uh, long and thorough. And I appreciate that um, because I, I think that, um, as you mentioned, that's a common question and it's really good to kind of get into the nuts and bolts of that. And I know that creative time operates you know, um, differently um, in many ways. And I'd love to hear um, your, your sort of answer to that question, Natasha, in terms of how does an artist get to collaborate with creative time? Yep, also a common question. Um, so there's a few different ways. So our primary uh, exhibitions of which I think we have a pretty different scale compared to the High Line and, and the Parks Department where we really are doing about two to three kind of larger scale commissions a year. Um, for those that we do follow a curatorial process. So usually it's the result of a very long-term conversation. Sometimes it's, I've worked on projects that have been seven years in the making in terms of the dialogue between the curator and the artist and some that have come to a, come together a bit more rapidly. But in terms of how they actually get greenlit or programmed, that time frame actually tends to, tends to be quite tight. So usually it's our, our curator and our curatorial team, our production team is in conversation and dialogue with many, many artists um, waiting for ideas to gel and manifest and sort of be resolved. And then when we, when we hit go, sometimes we've made projects in as short as three months. Um, it's not for the faint at heart. <laughs> and sometimes we have a little bit more lead time um, and Elizabeth has been such a friend to us and can speak to that. Um, um, in terms of our other ways that we work with artists, we have a project, a program that's about two years old, the open call. We have a project that's currently up in Prospect Park with our recent selected artist who's Kamala Shankaram. Um, and that is an um, open application that we do on a biennial basis. Um, it's new, we started the first project in 2019 and it's really intended for artists who have not yet had opportunity to create a work in public, in public space, um, a significant uh, commission and we put our full resources and team behind that in the same way that we work with our curatorially selected pro projects. Um, in terms of the summit, which is a slightly different way of collaborating, it's also kind of an in-depth curatorial process once we have the theme, but we do have certain components, dinners, activations, and series and workshops that are based on an application. So we do a little bit of both in our process. Great, great. Well, Elizabeth, we won't leave you out. Um, <laughs> Um, similar, you know, similar question. I'd love to, to get your take. Yeah, so our program is, um, I think, quite different in that we don't have a curatorial team. Um, our program is open to all. Uh, we have an open application process. There's no deadline. We do encourage exhibitors to submit six months in advance because the review process can be um, lengthy, especially dealing with, um, you know, park staff uh, who are not working in an office setting. Um, a lot of proposals, um, you know, artists and exhibitors come to us with a specific park in mind uh, that they want to exhibit in, but we don't require, you know, anyone submitting a proposal to have that in mind. You know, some people are like, this is my neighborhood park and I have a really strong connection to it. And this artwork is about that park and I want it there, which is great. 
but then we also speak with people who are like, I have this idea, I want to do it in a park, but I'm not sure what the right location is for it. Um, so taking the information that they have available about what their installation needs are, the scale of the piece and what it's about, we can come up with a list of sites that might work for that artwork. Um, and the artist would then go out to the sites, check them out, see what feels good to them, what they think is appropriate. Um, and then we, once they come back to us and we have a site, um, we review the proposal just to make sure that um, we're covering all the other bases like site suitability. It's not gonna impact regular park usage, um, that the artists are thinking about durability, public interaction, um, how it's constructed, uh, that it's going to be able to withstand public interaction, that the materials that they're using are um, uh, you know, just good to be used outdoors. Um, there's certain things that are challenging for artists that I would say there's very few proposals that we flat out deny. I think we try to work with artists collaboratively and arts organizations to find a way to make these projects happen um, in a way that is safe and that meets our requirements as well. Um, so I think being an open application project uh, process like that, we get a really wide variety of projects, which I showed before. Um, you know, some smaller projects like photo banners, you know, getting photographers to think about, you know, you don't just have to be inside to show your work. You can be out in a park on a vinyl banner um, to more, you know, ambitious projects like we've worked on with Creative Time and, and the Highline and other um, public art focused organizations like Public Art Fund are doing really big ambitious projects, but we have, you know, no shortage of, of some of the smaller community-based projects and individual artists that we're working with. Um, so I guess not to get too much in the nitty gritty of like the review process, but, um, you know, once we review, we also share it with our um, operations staff. You know, we know a lot of parks fairly well, but there's a lot of parks we don't know super well. And our operations staff, they're in the parks every day. They know how they're used. You know, they can direct um, us to another location. Like maybe this location isn't good because people barbecue here frequently, or this area is used as a dog, an unofficial dog run. So, you know, maybe that's not a great area either. Um, so we, they are kind of like our, um, boots on the ground, I guess, um, who can tell us more about how certain areas of the park are used. Um, so it's a lot of, um, I think, threading together what the artist and the exhibitor wants to do, what how the park is used, um, and how that can all kind of come together in a way that everyone feels good about. <laughs> No, I, I love that. I love the fact that um, you're talking about the sort of like hyper local specificity around use and actually engaging with the community. I think it's interesting having the three of you in this conversation because in a way, um, very distinct organizations that have, you know, different functions, but there have been some overlaps. I think, Elizabeth, you just alluded to collaborating with Creative Time and collaborating with the Highline. Um, can you give like one example of what that collaboration kind of looks like? Yeah, I think, Natasha, if you want, I could speak a little bit about um, the piece we have in Prospect Park um, with Creative Time and a lot of, um, you know, my role, I think, is, you know, speaking with Creative Time first and kind of explaining the process. And I sent Natasha, like, a list of different sites to check out with the artist and kind of speak to some of the people in the parks there to figure out what might be the best fit for the project and what felt right. Um, then once the park was selected, then we opened up a conversation with the operations staff to help um, sort out kind of the less exciting details like access to the site and power issues and things like that. So there's like kind of the curation in terms of that we help with the site, but then also a lot of the logistical heavy, heavy lifting because um, there's a lot of it when you're working with public art. So just making sure everyone's aware of where it's going, when it's going to be there, what that process is going to look like. Um, you know, in the case of uh, Creative Time's current piece, um, that there will be people on site X, Y, and Z days. This is when it's going to be activated. Um, so that's, you know, in this case too, because there's a lot around a lot of trees, it involved forestry, it involved, um, you know, our special events team, our uh, regional manager. So it's a lot of people involved in this in this particular project and a lot of projects are like that um so it's kind of I mean I guess it gives, makes my title as senior public art 
coordinator pretty um, fitting. There's <laughs> a lot of coordination. <laughs> I feel like what you're saying is that we are high maintenance. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> but <laughs> no. um, public art is high maintenance. It's true. Yeah, it is. I was, there's I was... so many things. <laughs> yeah, as you both know, uh, you know, there's so many things you have to be thinking about rather, you know, that you might not be thinking about in a white cube indoor space. Right. Um, but I always appreciate like any kind of challenge and I'm I'm constantly learning. I'm sure you both are too um, as you do the projects. Well, spe speaking of challenges, I mean, I, I think like, you know, every artist who does a public art project um, at some point in their career, they have to do their first one, right? Like, so no matter what, even if they want to be a public artist, at some point they have to do their first one. And, and, and certainly there are um, skills um, that uh, would help them in that process. So could you, could you sort of let me know your opinion on, on, on this, this subject? Is it budgeting? Is it um, is it knowing how to create better timelines? Is it is it team management? What are what are the skills that you think are most important for an artist to try to master if they want to really make uh, a go of it as an artist working in the public space? And this can be based upon your own experiences, or even or even your own war stories. <laughs> <laughs> I can start. I'm sure we all have something to offer there. I mean, I think there's, um, you know, I think a lot about uh, when I think about the work that we do or the work I've done kind of in cultural production or art production, it's really about creative problem solving um, and being open to learning, whether that's learning a new material or process or learning about a particular history or a community that you're interacting with, but kind of being thorough about the process um, of putting a work in the public space. I think really having an ear towards listening and receiving information, but also really kind of thinking, how do I get to a yes? Like how, there's so many possible obstacles, whether it's practical things like you need power or water in a place where there are none, or um, a budget limitation or resource or even a time resource. It's how do we kind of break that down into you know, small enough morsels of concrete so it's no longer an obstacle. Um, and certainly there are tools that help with that like budgeting and time management, time resources. There are plenty of databases and online tools that help make timeline management and communication and correspondence easier. But I also think that um, finding willing collaborators wherever you can has been something that has worked for me both at creative time and in my previous roles just being a friend to artists being a, you know a producer there are always people whether it's you know a family member a, a cousin a, a classmate a professor or an organization that's kind of willing and available to help or guide and I think asking for help and building teams is you know a a tried and true <laughs> mechanism for, for production. Well, thanks for that. I mean, Mel Melanie, I, I think you wanted to share something. Yeah, Natasha, that's such a great answer. Um, I, I think about it a lot in terms of the, the two, the many sides of the public. I mean, public art, it's, I, my answer to this always seems really obvious that it's outside and it's with the public. Um, and so the outside is maybe the funnier answer. Like if you can imagine the experience of standing inside a museum and thinking that you're a sculpture and you stand there for a week and think about what you'll encounter, relatively little. And if you're about to encounter someone who's about to try to take a photograph of another artwork and back up into you, likely someone will stop you from doing that. But if you are standing outside in the middle of a public square for seven days, you're going to get rained on, it's going to snow, there will be wind, there will be a million people who walk by you. Our, our production director always loves to say that if it's, if it's a one in a million chance that X will happen to the sculpture, it will happen in 2019, we had 8 million visitors, it will happen eight times. Um, and so just anticipating everything that could possibly happen to an object or a person outdoors in public space, especially in New York City. And the other side of it is the public, you know, that they are the joy of doing this and you get to have a 
or have your artwork have a more immediate experience with people than you would necessarily in an art space. Well, people are coming, they have an anticipation of the kind of thing that they're going to see, a certain way of being that you anticipate in an art space. And outdoors, people are encountering your work at face value. Um, and so part of that is, is the joy about being able to have that differently mediated experience, but also that if there's a certain read or certain information that you want to come along with the work or power or water or whatever kind of, or, you know, staffing support that it needs, that you need to think about that all as a part of the contextualization of the work that you might take for granted in a museum, of course, you'll have a wall label, but you need to think about what you're going to make the sign out of, what you'll install it with, how long it will last, all of these kinds of things ahead of time. No, that, that's great information. Um, the other question I had um, has to do, you know, it still kind of connects the community. So for example, um, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, obviously the High Line is a specific location. It's a, it's a mile and a half, but it is a very specific location in a specific neighborhood. Um, the Parks Department, well, that's New York City's five boroughs. So you're sort of like, you know, all over, uh, you know, New York. And so very different um, communities throughout the city. I'm born and raised in, in Brooklyn, New York. So I know New York as I guess as well as anybody else and how strange place it can be wonderful and strange someone on the outside observing creative time of the past. Um, you you guys kind of up and, uh, with Nick Cave of, uh, of New York City. Are you having difficulty hearing me? You're back now. I couldn't hear you for about 20 seconds there. Oh, really? Sorry, sorry. Um, I guess what I was getting at, um, the, the nature of my question, hopefully you can hear me now. Okay, great. It's like the AT&T commercial or something. <laughs> um, I think that um, what I was getting at was um, how being, um, for, for example, for, for the High Line, being in sort of Chelsea and then sort of meatpacking and then the run up to, to, to Chelsea and then the run up to what is now like Hudson Yards, um, you know, how community engagement happens um, for, for, for each of your organizations because you're all working in with community in a really, really different way, right? And different kinds of communities and different interests and I know that that can also have an impact, not necessarily on what you do, but it may have an impact on how you go about doing what you do. And maybe I'll, I'll start with uh, Natasha um, because um, you know um, it, I think of the three of your organizations, yours is the most sort of like um, transient in a way. Right, right, sure. Um, yeah, I mean, it's something that we think about a lot. And as I was saying, the projects, um, you know, we don't know where they're going to be most of the time. Occasionally a site comes to us and we have been talking to an artist and there's this serendipity and we really know a lot about it. But oftentimes we're learning about the place in which we're working um, as we're making the project, which is a real privilege and it can be a real challenge in terms of what community engagement looks like at a very local, very detailed level. For us, we always really start with what is this project about and who is the artist imagining it for? How are those questions answered within a very, very local context? So who's right here where this work is going to be and how do they tie in to these, um, to these issues or this topic or this idea? Sorry, my phone is going off in the background and I can't get to it right now. So I'm just gonna keep going. Um, so we, we, we approach it, each project is completely different. Um, and we really ask ourselves these guiding questions about who's there, who might want to be there, who is interested in dealing with this issue, how might we bring an existing community or introduce a new one to this topic or this artist. And then from there, we think about what mechanisms will serve the answers to those questions best. So an a small example is like what programming looks like changes with the project, with our project that's up in Prospect Park right now, we're actually using a podcast as the mechanism, which is a really interesting medium to think about in terms of access, right? How do we remove geographic barriers? And, and then beyond that, how do we think about access? Like, is there a transcript? How is it 
organize how can people reach this information um, even if they can't physically be there. So we really have these central guiding questions and then we start from the very beginning. So it's part of our conversation with artists while we're still figuring out what is the thing. We don't even know how to make the thing. We're like, we wanna do the thing. We have no idea how to you know, fly 2000 pigeons at sunset safely and humanely, but we're totally doing it. And while we figure out how to engineer that, we're also gonna think about how the people who are here and could be here are gonna be served by it. So it really does change project to project. And we love bringing the artists in to think about like their goals, who they're doing the project for. And when we think about you know, public art in New York City, that's everybody. And we know that not everyone, not all New Yorkers and everyone passing through New York are actually gonna be here, but what would it look like if we made a work that could be for everyone? So it's, it's an ongoing challenge and real opportunity for us to also keep learning as practitioners, as, as cultural producers, about what um, kind of community engaged activities could look like and who they're serving. It's a long-winded answer, but thanks. No, it's it's a great answer, and don't worry about the the kids in the background. I, I, you know, it's only a miracle that my kids have not burst in here and just destroyed our conversation. So, don't worry about it at all. Um, Melanie, I'd love to, to hear from you regarding community. You know, I say community engagement, but I really it's it's really communities <laughs> engagement, right? It's not one community. It's certainly not monolithic. Yeah, always. Um, it, I mean, it's such a great question. I I feel like. Like Natasha was saying, it really depends on the project. And so there's there's kind of a few different buckets of ways that we think about it. One of it is really the logistical side of the project and the nature of what the engagement with the work actually is. So uh, an example that I always go to is Olafur Eliasson's Collectivity Project, which was an installation of about 3 million white Lego pieces on the High Line with the invitation to build your vision of your ideal future city. Um, and so there were logistical questions. How do we not lose 3 million Lego pieces on the High Line? I will admit gardeners still occasionally come up to us having found a piece that's hidden in the plants for the last five years. Um, um, staffing that kind of a project. It was also next to Hudson Yards while Hudson Yards was under construction, which was an amazing opportunity to think about who has control of our built environment. Um, but so there were questions of like, how do we program it? Do we have educators? How are folks being prompted to engage with this? And so we were engaging with a lot of school groups who would come, young people who would come, but also the kind of day-to-day -day, um, interaction and conversations that were facilitated by folks on site. Um, then there's subject matter expertise and connecting with different amazing cultural and non-cultural and non-arts organizations across the city. Depending on the project, we just two about two weeks ago had a really large festival with an artist named Cecilia Vicuña. It was called Insectageddon. Um, and her prompt for us was, was essentially to save insects from insect extinction as one of the many symptoms of climate change. And in the development of the festival, we were looking for advisors who were experts on the topic. And so we worked with the NYC Pollinator Working Group with an amazing sixth grader named Anusha Vaish, who is an insect saver extraordinaire and has her own educational website about insects. We had poets, we had educators, we had an amazing man named the Flatbush Gardener who came and gave citizen scientists um, educational workshops. And so throughout the entire process, we were both learning ourselves, but connecting with folks who are already experts and already doing work around insects, both on near the Highland and in New York City and around the country. And so that was a way to connect with individuals, but then also to connect with all of the communities who are already connected to all of those folks doing that work. Um, and then last, but by absolutely no means least, we have a massive programming and engagement department here. And so we have two folks who work in community engagement, folks who work in education, and then the Highline has a network of infrastructure reuse projects across the continent, as well as a public space alliance of infrastructure reuse projects in New York City, and then a network of what's called sustainable gardens projects, which are largely green thumb and school connected gardens across New York City. And so we're always looking for different ways to partner with those existing networks around cultural programming and then we work really closely with community engagement to work with folks who live in the neighborhood, both going to projects that they're hosting themselves and inviting them to come join us for projects. We have a neighbors council. Um, so that's a lot of the work that we'll do connecting with our colleagues who are working with closely with folks who live and work in the neighborhood. Oh, that's that's fantastic. Um, and thank, thanks for sharing that. And you know, Elizabeth, 
it's, it's an, another point I wanted to make as it relates to community engagement. It's sort of like, you know, when I think of creative time, the one thing that I think of the most, and, and creative time has done tons of things, but I always think of Kara Walker's, you know, uh, sculpture. Like, you know, that's like the one thing, you know, it's like almost like uh, in my mind, if I was on a game show and someone said creative time, first thing that comes to mind, it would be that. Um, only because I remember when I visited the, that, um, that sculpture, the line was, it was, it must have been 10 blocks long. I mean, thankfully I had some connections, so I was able to skip the line. Uh, <laughs> and, and then, you know, who skipped me? The actress Julian Moore skipped me. <laughs> so I was like, oh, I'm, a, I'm certainly in the right place. <laughs> uh, no, she, she could certainly skip me, love her work. Um, so anyway, um, I only bring that up to say, um, when I think of creative time, I think of there's a place where something's happening and I'm deciding I'm gonna go. Now, certainly there are people that already live in that, that community or that place, but I feel like, you know, it's an event, like something I'm going to, I, you know, my perception. And then with the Highline, similar. I mean, I may go to the Highline just to take a wonderful walk you know, but I know that that's, that's a place I've decided to go. I, I think when I think of uh, NYC parks, although there are parks to New York City that people will travel from their neighborhood to go to, I think of parks as being hyper-local in the sense like, you know, people have a sense of, like, a sense of ownership of their park that might be a bit different than, say, you know, the High Line or, say, where Creative Time may activate. Um, a public, um, you know, um, public art. And so how is, how is navigating that been? Because I, I just know from experience that people, if they've lived across the street from a park for 35, 40 years, they feel like that's their park. Yeah, for sure. And I think that is one of the challenges of, of you know, our program is, you know, there are certain parks like the High Line and Madison Square Park and you know, Uptown and Marcus Garvey Park, we've done a lot of artwork there. So there's certain parks where I think the communities have come to expect public art um, in a way that's great. Um, you know, it can be a challenge going into communities or parks where we haven't done public art before. Um, we, you know, it's, I guess, thinking about we do our best to reach out to people in the community. If there's a local group, like a friends group or a stewardship group who's involved in the park, we'll try and speak with them and um, share the project with them. But, uh, you know, I'm sure Melanie and Natasha know this as well, that art is so subjective. And especially when you're doing something in what is considered many people's backyards <laughs> in the city, a lot of people, you know, treat the parks as it is their backyard, you know, some people love it, some people hate it. Um, in New York, they're not afraid to let you know if they don't like something or if they do like something. So, um, you know, we do get a lot of feedback and I think some of the feedback, you know, we do take to heart, you know, if someone feels that putting an artwork in a certain park in a certain space is impeding how people are using the park, you know, that'll make us think, you know, next time an artist is interested in that park, maybe that's not the best spot for it. But um, we do get some people who have, um some opinions about what it is we do and you kind of have to filter through a lot of that you know you're never going to make everyone happy but um you know we just always strive to work in a way that the art is an enhancement to the park it makes people think i think in a lot of exhibitions like some are really pop popular and people will travel to see them but a lot of times it's something you kind of just stumble upon you know in your park one day it's there there for a few weeks and then it's gone but while it's there you know it gives people a different way to think about um you know their park or or you know in the instance of like a lot of the photo projects we've been doing thinking about larger issues you know in the neighborhood i think a lot of organizations are starting to think more about being site specific and and creating work and individual artists too but creating work that responds to the community the park um, you know, engaging people more in the community, like maybe in the creation of the work or, or through programming and supplemental things like that, like workshops. But, um, you know, I've learned over the last few years, you're never going to please everyone with what you do with public art. And I think um, we do our best to try and do as much community engagement as we can. But with the volume of projects we're doing, I don't always think that, I always think we could do better, but it's hard to find the time to like, you know, um, go out and make those like real connections for every single project. <laughs> 
Well, um, thanks. And I, I'm going to honor our time. So we're down to the final few minutes. And uh, what I, I know we're not supposed to pick favorites. So I want to ask you what's your favorite project. But what I will ask you is what's coming up that you're excited about? Um, and I'll, I'll start with you, Melanie. Um, so we are entering the colder months where we start to slow down a little bit. We are in the process of planning and production for everything that'll come up next spring, um, which is not announced yet. So stay tuned. But I will say we've had an ongoing series of conversations around Sam Durant's Plinth Commission Untitled Drone um, about surveillance this year. We have the last two talks coming up. Um, next week, we have a talk about three chapters in US history with three absolutely brilliant scholars. I cannot wait for this. I can drop it in the chat, but you can find it on the um, Highlines website. And then we have a conversation about surveillance and privacy and public health at the end of October. Um, and then we will be looking forward to announcing the third Plinth Commission next year um, and launching that project in the fall of next year. So those are some fun things to look out for. Super, super. And I'll, I'll go to you, Natasha. Um, sorry for the background noise. Uh, yes, well, we've been doing a, a, a different project this year in addition to the commissions called the Think Tank, which is a, co a cohort of nine individuals we brought together in the, during the pandemic to think about what, equi what an equitable field cultural production could look like. And it's been a really fascinating process to watch these folks who are non-sighted, so it's existed completely online. Um, kind of brilliantly bring their various skill sets together to really think about tangible recommendations, ideas, possibilities, you know, what does um, kind of adjust, what does equity, what does labor look like when this, in, this, in this crazy field that we work in um, with artists on the line, so, you know, all the time. And we're nearing um, the end of their year together, of their 10 months together, and they're cooking up something incredible i can't even barely articulate with any sense of eloquence like what it is that they've come up with but i'm looking forward to sharing that this fall um and it'll exist digitally and be really available for an, an ongoing dialogue and an engagement across the field so something different than an exhibition for us but it really sits at that space of sort of thought making and ideas and really focusing on this idea of collective future that is really kind of ours to own so it's something that i'm really passionate about Thank you so much. And Elizabeth, um, we'll end with you. What are you looking forward to? Um, you know, I think we're coming to the tail end of our season this year, and it does tend to get quieter in the winter. I think I've been doing a lot of thinking back on the last year and a half, um, you know, between not doing projects last year, you know, doing some projects towards the end of last year, kind of a regular season this year, and just kind of interested to see what next year holds. I think it's been a really um, good year for, we've done a lot of projects that are addressing social justice issues, um, the impact of COVID. A lot of um, exhibitors we worked with have had to innovate in certain ways to you know, work with and around public health mandates and all of that. Um, so I am looking forward to hopefully things being a little, um, you know, a little bit more back to normal and just in terms of, you know, public health and being able to have more in person programming and things like that. I think, um, you know, public art has been such a great thing, um, especially in parks, uh, when people have been outside so much, but I think, you know, some of the, the gatherings um, have been missed. I think, you know, some people are still very nervous about it. Um, so I'm hoping that, you know, next year we'll be able to, um, have a lot more in-person celebrations for the public art projects like we have in the past. Thanks for sharing that. So um, I wanna thank the three of you so much for your generous time um, and all of the insight that you've shared with us. Um, I'm going to uh, sign off and just uh, you know say that uh, this has been recorded. It will be on um, available on New York Academy of Arts website, also YouTube channel. And again, I really do appreciate your time and your insight today. Have a good evening, all three of you. Thank you so much. And nice to see y'all, um, hopefully in Same. person. Thank you so much. Good night. Thank Good you. Night.